Hey Booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. My name is Peg, thanks for joining me here. Um, this video is a TBR. Um, it's a not all-inclusive TBR just because um, uh, I hope to get at some point soon some software and get some time to learn how to edit and so I can put in pictures like jacket covers of books that I'm reading so I can just pop them in and you can see uh, I'm reading several advanced review copies on PDFs on my Kindle and they don't have jacket covers that I could even hold up my Kindle to show you um, but I am reading ebooks um, and then I have a stack of books here that I'll be starting probably this weekend uh, not all at once obviously but I'll be you know <laughs> these are the books I'm going to show you these are books that I'm set to um, to review for different publications um, either online pr print or both um, and I'll explain as I go through each one what, what they're going for um, and here's another one actually I'm finishing this one up but uh, you know I do a lot of book hauls on this channel just because they're the easiest ones to make uh, a lot of times you know I work full-time <laughs> so I do this in the evenings late evenings afternoons uh, weekends, whenever I, I can squeeze in a video. And, and book hauls are the easiest ones, right? Um, because they're right there and I kind of just stack them up, show you what have come in from publishers. Uh, it takes time to circle back around and pick up all the books that I've read and report back. And I, you know, I apologize for not uh, being better about that. But um, I do try to show on my social media and share the books that I have um, have written reviews on and uh, share with you. So please, if you want to follow my reviews and see what I'm, I'm reading and have finished reading and have written about, uh, you can uh, follow me on Twitter, Instagram. I have a History Shelf Facebook page and I share those on all of those outlets. Um, so you could, well, it's in the comment box below all my social media if you just wanna click on those and, and subscribe or follow. And it's also in my banner on my YouTube homepage. You'll see my little social media icon. So that's my pitch for that. Um, just to, to show you that it's not just, I'm not just procuring books, <laughs> although I, I get a lot of them, um, but I'm also reading a hell of a lot. <laughs> and uh, it's just so difficult sometimes to make these videos, but I wanted to show you what's coming. So I thought that actually might be the easiest for now until I can uh, get some editing software and circle back around and just kind of, you know, flip through the different jacket covers and give you a quick synopsis and my thoughts on it. Um, okay, so having said all that, uh, I'm almost finished with this book. I'll be writing a review for it in an upcoming issue of Book Browse. And yeah, I haven't finished, so maybe this is not, you know, I'm jumping the gun, but I think it's fairly safe to say that this is a home run. <laughs> oh boy, is it a home run. Electra by Jennifer Saint. This is her follow-up to her first novel, Ariadne, which I had also read. Uh, in an advanced review copy uh, when it first came out and I I did a I think it was a part of a book club for it on book browse and we talked about it either that or a first impressions which they offer um, <laughs> and you know how people say like the sophomore slump or the sophomore follow-up book is a is usually very weak or it's weaker than the first I'm telling you what I am enjoying this one even more than Ariadne way more now maybe it's the story maybe it's just the story of Clytemnestra that I'm really digging um in it you know it's related with the the Trojan War which of course I the Iliad being one of my favorites and you can see the Iliad up on my shelf over there I can never get my hand right there it is <laughs> I got the Odyssey and the Iliad up there um it's the story is just so powerful you know Agamemnon and Clytemnestra um, there's Helen there's Electra there's Oh, there's Paris, there's Achilles, there's, there's a, a slew of different characters, but what's going on in the story, and it's, it's brilliantly told from a woman's viewpoint, which she also did in Ariadne. So, you know, the Iliad, you get the male side of things, in a sense. But Jennifer Saint takes things very deep, and, and she's very just, oh, she has, I feel like I'm right there when I'm reading these novels. I feel like I'm in ancient Greece. I'm viewing these people in their, you know, their courtyards, their temples, their, uh, it's just, she's, she really just takes you there. Um, and I am nearly finished and it's, it's just blown my socks off. So I can, I can highly recommend 
Jennifer Saint should be out right now. Um, but okay, let me tell you, let me read you the, the description just so you have it. So it says three women tangled in an ancient curse. All right. When Clytemnestra marries Agamemnon, she ignores the insidious whispers about his family line, the house of Atreus. But when on the eve of the Trojan War, Agamemnon betrays Clytemnestra in the most unimaginable way, she must confront the curse that has long ravaged their family. In Troy, Princess Cassandra, that's the other woman here, uh, has the gift of prophecy but carries a curse of her own. No one will ever believe what she sees. When she is shown what will happen to her beloved city when Agamemnon and his army arrive, she is powerless to stop the tragedy from unfolding. Electra, Clytemnestra and Agamemnon's youngest daughter, wants only for her beloved father to return home from war. But can she escape her family's bloody history, or is her destiny bound by violence too? And this is our author, Jennifer Saint, and she has just been knocking it out of the park. I cannot wait to see what her next novel along these lines will be um ancient you know stories of greek tragedy myth i i just uh you know the the olympic gods wow she is really good okay so i'll <laughs> i'm just i'm waxing uh just you know eloquent here with her well i'm not eloquent but i am enjoying this so much i will hate for it to end um highly recommend it. okay so so once that one is finished, okay, let me move into uh, actually a nonfiction. Uh, this is actually part of a book browse um, feature that they offer, which is called First Impressions. And they offer it to uh, members who um, would be willing to just write up a brief 100 word description or, you know, their immediate feedback for a new book. Um, and so I signed up for this one because it sounded really good to me. Um, this is Daughters of the Flower Fragrant Garden, Two Sisters Separated by China's Civil War by Zhu King Li. And this is put out by Norton. Um, all right, so I'll be starting this one very, very soon here. Uh, let's see, John and Hong were scions of a once great southern chi Chinese family. Each other's best friend, they grew up in the 1930s during the final days of old China before the tumults of the 20th century brought political revolution, violence, and a fractured national identity. By a quirk of timing, at the end of the Chinese Civil War, June ended up on an island under nationalist control and then settled in Taiwan, married a nationalist general, and lived among fellow exiles at odds with everything the mainland's new communist regime, regime stood for. Hong found herself far across the sea on the mainland, forced to publicly disavow both her own family background and her sister's decision to abandon the party. A doctor by training, to overcome the suspicion created by her family circumstances, Hong endured two waves of re-education and internal exile, forced to work in some of the most desperately poor remote areas of the country. Ambitious, determined, and resourceful, uh, both women faced morally fraught decisions as they forged careers and families in the midst of political and social upheaval. June established one of U.S. allied Taiwan's most important trading companies. Hong became one of the most celebrated doctors in China, appearing on national media and honored for her dedication to medicine. Niece to both sisters, uh, linguist and East Asian scholar Zhu King Li, the, the, the author, tells her aunt's story for the first time, honoring her family's history with sympathy and grace. Uh, it is a window into the lives of women in 20th century China, a time of traumatic change and unparalleled re resilience. Um, in this riveting and deeply personal account, Li confronts the bitter political rivals of mainland China and Taiwan with elegance and unique insight while celebrating her aunt's remarkable legacies. That is, that, doesn't that sound great? Um, and especially, gosh, well, not especially, but these, these, um, this is very much in the news right now, you know, obviously the, the tensions between China and Taiwan and the people, some people. So we've got Daughters of the Flower Fragrant Garden. I'll be starting that this weekend. Okay. Uh, and then I'll be doing, I'll be reviewing three books. <laughs> uh, three, I guess you'd call historical fiction. One might not be. Um, 
for historical novels review. As you know, I've, I mentioned before that I write for them. I sign up every every two months for uh, a slate of books, usually two, sometimes three, and I went ahead and asked for three. <laughs> and they're, they're all due um, in less than a month from now, like June 15th. So I'll be a busy little bee. Let's go first with this book, which sounded really interesting, and that's why I requested to be the one to review it. This is called The Maiden of All Our Desires by Peter Manso. Manso. Uh, it's put out by Arcade Books. This is the I got a final copy, which is great. Okay. And it's set during the Black Death. So, you know, I was like, oh, yay. <laughs> Why am I drawn to these things? I don't know. 14th century Europe. Uh, the Black Death has killed half the known world, and in an isolated convent, a small group of nuns, of course, that's why it attracted me, too. If there's, like, religious or religious orders and nuns, I just love stuff like that. Ah. Uh, nuns spend their days in work, austerity, and devotion, chanting the liturgy of the hours, but their community is threatened. Rumors of, rumor, hey, rumors of heresy and a scandalous book of Ursula based on the teachings of the charismatic former abbess and founder of the order, have prompted the male church hierarchy to launch an investigation. The priest assigned to minister to the nuns, Father Francis, who is racked by guilt for an unspeakable crime committed during the lawless plague years, was no friend of Ursula and can't be counted on to defend the order. Disrespect and rebellion infect some novices, and the youngest among them pines for the bishop's chief inquisitor. And Mother John the convent's aging spiritual leader, fears she's losing her mind after experiencing a vision that brings back her own rebellious past. Let me take a quick sip. As events unfold over the course of a single day, a blizzard that has swept across Europe will break over the convent, endangering the women there and testing their faith. In this astonishing novel, the author of the award-winning Songs for the Butcher's Daughter explores the territory between faith and freedom and how the horrific events of history shape individual lives. Um, so I've never read anything by Peter Menso. I'd never heard of him before. And uh, this is a brand new novel. And I thought I'd take a chance on it. It's about a 300-page novel. And I'd never heard of Song for the Butcher's Daughter either. Um, there's our author. Sounds pretty interesting, huh? So that is coming up soon. I've got to get cracking. So then I moved over to a novel of World War, World War II. You know, I enjoy some historical fiction uh, set during World War II. I've read a variety of different ones, whether spies, thrillers, general, you know, family sagas, whatever. Um, and this is an uncorrected proof. So this, this comes out... Um, this comes out August 9th. So put this on your radar if this sounds interesting to you. This is called The Last of the Seven. A Novel of World War II by Stephen Hartov. You got some paratroopers, so that's what that's about. It's uh, being put out by Hanover Square Press, so August 9th. Let's say here, a spellbinding World War II novel based on the little-known history of the ex-troop, a team of European Jews who escaped the continent only to join the British Army and return home to exact their revenge on Hitler's military. Uh, a lone soldier wearing a German uniform stumbles into a British military camp in the North African desert with an incredible story to tell. He is the only survivor of an undercover operation meant to infiltrate a Nazi base, trading on the soldier's perfect fluency in German. However, this man is not British-born, but instead a German Jew seeking revenge for the deaths of his family back home in Berlin. As the Allies advance into Europe, the young lieutenant is brought to recover uh, in Sicily, um, there, he is recruited by a British major to join the newly formed X Troop, a commando unit composed of German and Austrian Jews training for a top-secret mission at a nearby camp in the Sicilian hills. They are all, quote, lost boys, end quote, driven not by patriotism but by vengeance. Uh, drawing on meticulous research into this unique group of soldiers, The Last of the Seven is a lyrical, propulsive historical novel uh, perfect for readers of Mark Sullivan, Robert Harris, and Alan First. All right, so sounded really good to me. You know I love a good World War II story, especially if it's based on something uh, true. So, uh, yeah, this comes out August 9th. So if you're interested, let me know. And also, um, 
If you want to hear back on my thoughts on some of these books, just uh, send me a comment or, you know, uh, in the video or down below in the comments. Um, some of these, you know, obviously you can follow on my social media. Historical Novels Review, I think you've got to be a member to see the um, to see the review, but I'd be happy to kind of just talk briefly about it, not, you know, give away too much. Anyway, uh, and then finally, this was a this was the my impulse at the last minute when they sent out the third list of books. I was like, okay, I'll take one more. <laughs> um, this is coming out in June, so next month, very soon. Um, let me see if I can pronounce the name. This is an advanced copy of "The Scent of Burnt Flowers" by Blitz Bazawul. Bazawul. Uh, so yeah, it comes out June 28th, so about a month from now. So December 26th, 1965. A pit stop in the wrong part of an Alabama town ends with blood on a newly engaged couple's hands, and the only way they'll survive persecution is to flee the country. With a persistent FBI agent on their trail, they travel to Ghana to seek asylum and the help of an old college friend who happens to be the country's embattled president. The couple's chance encounter with one of Ghana's most beloved musicians, who's headed to perform for the president, sparks a journey full of suspense, lust, magic, and danger as the regime crumbles around them. What was meant to be a fresh start quickly threatens both their relationship and their lives. It says, says here, uh, steeped in the history of West Africa at the intersection of the civil rights movement in the U.S., this hypno hypnotic debut novel merges political intrigue otherworldly encounters, and forbidden romance in an epic collision of morality and power. So uh, it, it, it intrigued me. I thought, well, you know what? And it's a debut novel. Sometimes I like to, to read, um, you know, new authors. So uh, The Scent of Burnt Flowers, and it's coming out next month by Ballantine Books. There you go. All right, so those are for historical novels review. And then the next three are options for, um, I'm going to try to get them all done <laughs> a month in advance, uh, for shelf awareness, which you know I write for. It's a great uh, like newsletter you can sign up for and uh, has uh, weekly roundups of new releases with very brief, everyone's time is very valuable, unless you have tons of time to sit around and read a long form essay of a book review. Um, which I wish I had more time to do. <laughs> but if you want to get a synopsis of a book real quick, 250 words, Shelf Awareness is a place to go. They also have longer like interviews and stuff like this, but um, if you just want to get like a weekly roundup of stuff, check out Shelf Awareness. I will link them below, and you can look for me by my name, um, uh, you know, Peggy Kurkowski. So well, there you have it. You can look me up uh, if you can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> Such a All righty. Um, so this book is coming out July 5th, and this is a very sm little small. I don't know if it's going to be a bigger physical book, but right now it's very small. Very kind of small, not very tall, but it's Voices in the Dead House by Norman Locke. And this is, come, this is published by Bellevue Literary Press. All right. It says here, after the uh, Union Army's defeat at Fredericksburg in 1862, Walt Whitman and Louisa May Alcott converge on Washington to nurse the sick, wounded, and dying. Whitman was a man of many contradictions, egocentric, yet compassionate, impa impatient with re religiosity, yet moved by the spiritual in all humankind, bigoted, yet soon to become known as the great poet of democracy. Alcott was an intense, intellectual, independent woman, an abolitionist and suffragist who was compelled by financial circumstance to publish saccharine magazine stories, yet would go on to write the enduring and beloved Little Women. As Locke captures the musicality of their unique uh, voices and their encounters with luminaries ranging from Lincoln to battlefield photographer Matthew Brady to reformer Dorothea Dix, he deftly renders the war's impact on their personal and artistic development. Inspired by Whitman's poem, The Wound Dresser, and Alcott's Hospital Sketches, the ninth standalone book in the American Novels series is a masterful dual por portrait of two iconic authors who took different paths toward chronicling a, a country beset by prejudice and at war with itself. 
Yeah, I, I've not heard of this American Novels series, but apparently, obviously, this is a part of it. Um, and it looks like Norman Locke is, he's working on the next book of the American Novel series. I don't know if he, does he write all of them? I wonder. Yes, he does. It says here, like, select praise for Norman Locke's American Novel series. I might have to see what else he's written if I like this one. Okay, yeah, he's written quite a bit. So Voices in the Dead House. Um, and this is, uh, what did I say? July 5th. Um, so if you're interested, if it sounds great to you, uh, you can read my review when it comes out the week of publication, I believe, usually the week or the week after, in Shelf Awareness. So starting that. Uh, oh, I'm so excited to cover this one because I have read another book by this gentleman and it made me just want to read many of his other World War II adventure uh, novels. In fact, I'm going to order one of them from Hamilton Book, which is marked down. And it's about the dive bombers, I believe, at Midway. So I'm very excited. But this is the, the newest book. And I had already uh, written a review on P.T. Duderman's World War II adventures for his trial by fire. I had, I had written a review for that for um, historical novels review, but this time I'll be reviewing it for Shelf Awareness, and I'm excited. So this is P.T. Duderman's latest upcoming novel, The Last Paladin. Um, and this comes out, I'll just hold this up for you. Hang on a second. This comes out July. It doesn't give me a date in July. Oh, it does. July 19. Okay. So, and it's put out by St. Martin's Press. Um, very happy to get a advanced review copy of this to show you. Um, it says here, based on a gripping true story of the USS Hayward, a World War II Atlantic Fleet destroyer escort, The Last Paladin is P.T. Duderman's latest novel of bravery amidst unforgiving battle for survival against the German U-boats in the North Atlantic. Oh, man. Summoned to relieve destroyers that are bogged down by escort duty in the escalating Pacific theater, the Hayward is met with a rather cold reception. In the eyes of Pacific Fleet sailors, North Atlantic convoy duty pales in comparison to the bloody carrier-sinking battles of Savo Island and Guadalcanal. However, Atlantic fleet ships have led to specialize have had to specialize in one thing, anti-submarine warfare. The Hayward is sent off into remote South Pacific operating sea areas with orders to find and destroy Japanese submarines, but with little expectation of success. Her commanders take the mission literally. Using radio intercepts that are being ignored at higher levels, they determine that the Japanese have set up a 1,000-mile-long picket line of six submarines, an entire squadron's worth, to act as a movable barrier against the expected American advance into the next set of islands. These submarines are poised to sink every American aircraft carrier and destroyer and to change the course of the war. What happens next is one of the legendary stories of the U.S. Navy. Uh, the Last Paladin is high-stakes naval warfare at its best, told with utter authenticity and a former ship captain's understanding of dramatic, intense combat. Uh, master of military adventure fiction, P.T. Duderman continues his acclaimed series of World War II thrillers in this unforgettable novel. Uh, oh, this is fantastic. I might see if I can get an interview with Mr. Duderman. <laughs> I'm getting excited. <laughs> I do want to do more uh, author interviews on this channel. Um, and uh, his trial by fire was amazing. Uh, I think it was about the fire on the, the battleship Franklin or aircraft carrier, af aircraft carrier Franklin. And his descriptions were just uh, terrifying. And he knows ships inside and out. I mean, I, I basically needed, I wanted to have a schematic <laughs> so I could see, you know, get a sense for the ship's innards, as it were. But um, I'm very excited to read this next book. So I will be reviewing this again for Shelf Awareness. Uh, it's coming out in July 19. So stay tuned. I will be reporting on that. Uh, let's see. So uh, 24 minutes. So um, final book is nonfiction. Uh, I will be reviewing this for Shelf Awareness as well. And I'll be starting this soon. Let me see if I can. I'll just keep it held up for you guys. So this is coming out also July 19th. 
And this is The Inheritors, an intimate portrait of South Africa's racial reckoning by Eve Fairbanks. And this is being put out by, also by, well, no, this is Simon & Schuster. Okay. It's already gotten a lot of blurbs. Sorry for the glare on that. It's just, I need this light. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, a decade in the making. The Inheritors tracks three ordinary South Africans over 50 years in a sweeping, exquisitely written look at what really happens after a country resolves to end white supremacy. Uh, Dipuo grew, grew up on the south side of the mine dump that separated Johannes, Johannesburg's black townships from the white-only city. Some nights she hiked to the top. On the other side were glittering lights as well as, she knew, prejudice and hubris. On her side there was dust, but also love. To a South African teenager in the 1980s, even an anti-apartheid activist like Dipuo, the divide appeared eternal. But then in 1994, the world's last explicitly segregationist regime collapsed to make way for something unprecedented. The end of apartheid carried South Africa past a point the United States and Europe are still moving slowly towards. The ascent to political, cultural, and intellectual power of members of the demographic groups the countries once colonized or enslaved. The inheritors oh, sorry, uh, weaves together the stories of Dipuo, her daughter Maleka, and Christo, one of the last white South Africans drafted to fight for apartheid as the system crumbled around him, to consider what happens when people once locked into certain kinds of power relations find their status shifting. With intimate reporting, keen psychological insight, and luminous prose, the book probes how everyday people grapple with great social change, exploring questions that preoccupy not only South Africans, but so many of us today. How can we let go of our individual and national pasts? How should old debts be paid? How much sympathy do we owe one another? And how does a person live an honorable life in a society that, for both better and worse, they no longer recognize? So, uh... That sounds pretty dang good, doesn't it? Um, yes. So this is going to be a big one. This is almost 400 pages. Woo! Better get started on that. But yeah, so I'll be writing a review. That's going to be due on June 15th, and then you'll it'll be out in the um, the next issue, probably a month after that. Okay. So now that I've completely freaked myself out <laughs> by how much I got to read. <laughs> um, Oh, and that doesn't add in a book I need to start, like, yesterday, <laughs> probably tonight, um, on my Kindle um, for another publication that shall remain nameless, um, is uh, a new book coming out called The Mosquito Bowl, um, and it's by the author of Friday Night Lights, but uh, chronicles like... Um, some of the Marine regiments um, prior to the invasion of Okinawa, and I think a football game that they uh, that they put on somehow miraculously. I don't know. I haven't even begun it yet, but that was like the vagueness that I got from that the description. So uh, it's like a four hundred page book. So um, that's due in about oh gosh, about eleven days. So I need to start reading. As you can see, I'm always reading, guys, so please just know that it's only because I don't have a lot of time to go back and edit and put things together. But I hope you enjoyed this TBR, um, and, you know, uh, again, follow me on social media. That, that way you can see the output of what's coming out of the history shelf. <laughs> and I will try to report back as much as I can on books. Um, it's just been an extremely busy time post-move. Um, I, I am hoping for more breathing room as things uh, open up, hopefully. So anyway, guys, let me know what you think of this upcoming TBR. And uh, more books are coming in constantly. So I will have other things I'm reading as well. So anyway, tell me what you're reading, okay? And we'll talk soon. Take care. Bye.